Here's a visualization of what we are actually doing in PLS. The loadings in X and Y are now rotated from the PCA solution to what a PLS model is actually doing. And you can see especially in X the model is really rotating the loading a lot. And in the lower plot you can see that when you rotate the loading the scores will change correspondingly. And if you look at the correlation in the title of the lower plot, you can see that the correlation between T and U is, is increasing as the loading changes. That's because PLS is trying to maximize the covariance and that leads also in this case to a higher co correlation. And now you can see we have the PLS solution. So in the upper plots we have raw X data to the left raw Y data to the right, and we show the first PLS component. The loading is the blue line in the upper plots, the P loading for the X data, and the, y, the Q loading for the Y data. The readings of each point on these blue lines will give us the score values, T and U, respectively. And in the lower plot, we have plotted the T's and the U's versus each other. So essentially we see the one component PLS model. And what we can see from the lower plot is that once we have the X scores, we can predict with a certain accuracy the U scores from that. And then we can use the Y loadings to convert the U score into a prediction of Y. Here we see the PCA solution and the PLS solution. So it's important to stress here that even though we talked about this a little bit as something close to PCA, PLS is not actually doing PCA on X and Y. Instead, it is doing a model that is structurally the same, that is, it has scores and loadings, but it is, a, it is calculating these scores and loadings from a different uh, criterion. In PLS, the criterion is that we want the scores of X and Y to have maximum covariance. That's what PLS is doing. Before we look more into the PLS theory, let's take a small example to illustrate how it works. Here we have a data set consisting of 12 samples, 12 samples of raspberry jam, and on these different jams, there has been performed uh, a sensory evaluation. So a sensory evaluation is a professional panel that assesses the different jams with respect to different well-defined descriptors, such as color, redness, sweetness, etc. So it's a quantitative method. It's a very uh, adequate method for different kinds of quality control and product optimization, but it's also very expensive. And it would be nice if it was possible to avoid the sensory e evaluation and instead predict that from cheaper measurements. And those cheaper measurements are given here as six instrumental me uh, measurements. Some color measurements L, A and B, and three additional uh, measurements. So we want to build a model that can predict the sensory data from the instrumental data. And we have 12 samples that are made so as to span the normal variation. They come from different harvest places and from different uh, harvesters. We build the model. And once the model has been calculated, we get a regression overview, the plot shown here. If you want to get back to the regression overview later on, you can always press the plot menu and the first menu item will be this regression overview. In the upper left corner, for example, we have a score plot and to the lower left of the slide you can see what is plotted in that score plot, namely the scores of the X model. In the right plot, we have the loadings of both X and Y in the lower left plot, we have the residual variance explaining how well the model is doing uh, as a function of the number of components. And to the lower right, we have the predictions. And in this case, it's the prediction 
uh, of the redness, so of one of the several Y variables, one of the several sensory variables. We will go through these plots in the next slides, but this general overview is good to remember or look into once you start doing your own models. The score plot. If you want to generate just a score plot, you can always do that in the plot menu as shown and you can select what scores you want to look at. In this case we can see on the axis that we are plotting component 1 versus component 2. If you want to change those, you can do it when you do the plotting or you can also use the arrows, arrow up, down and left, right to change the uh, component number uh, on the axis. So the score plot provides us with an overview of the different samples. And in this case, if you look at the different numbers and labels, you can see, for example, that you have many of the H freeze positioned to the right, lower right. That means that the late harvesting is predominantly on the right side, whereas the early harvesting H1 is on the left side. So we see a clear tendency here with respect to harvesting time. In the lower part of the plot you see some percentages and those are important to remember uh, to look into. We see two numbers for X and two numbers for Y and that's the explained percentage of variation for the first and the second component uh, or the first and second axis respectively. So we see that for example the first component which we just uh, realized was primarily related to harvesting, well that explains 67% of the variation in X. And if we look on the Y side we see that it also explains around 65% of the variation in Y. Since we are building prediction models we are mainly interested in how well we can predict Y. So we mainly look at the right side. But if, for example, the percentage on the X side was very low, well, that would tell us that we are only using a little bit of the variation in X to predict the Y values. That's not a problem in, it in itself, as long as the predictions are good. But it could be important information if, for example, we expected that all the information was relevant. Another interesting plot is the loading plot. And here both the X and the Y loadings are plotted. You can click these on and off uh, in the icons uh, near the menu of Unscrambler. Uh, but in this case we have chosen to show both X and Y values. What we can see is for example that redness and color are located close to each other. So people uh, tend to give these two attributes uh, the same relative uh, score. So if we only keep one of them, essentially we won't uh, lose much information. We also see that thickness is oppositely correlated because that is positioned to the left. So when the sensory attribute redness is high, then thickness tends to be low. We can also see how these Y variables correlate to our X data, our instrumental data. For example, that the LAB readings, the colors, are correlated to thickness and oppositely correlated to what is called color, which is really the raspberry color, the redness uh, of uh, the different jams. We also see that there are no um, irrelevant variables, uh, presumably, because we have no loadings located near 0.0. .0. Before we make such a conclusion though, we have to make sure that we do not have any significant outliers in our samples, otherwise our conclusions might be uh, misleading. The validation explained, what do we see in this plot? This is the result of a cross-validation. And what we see here is how much uh, residual variation we have in our sensory data as a function of the number of components. For PC0, the first bar, we haven't explained anything that is the variance uh, before we start modeling. 
we see that one component explains a good part and that's also what we saw in the plot before where we saw that 65 percent was explained by the first component the second component explains an additional uh, s a part of the variation but then we see that the third fourth fifth and sixth component they do not help improving uh, the predictions on the contrary if we include those we get worse predictions so based on this and still assuming that we have no outliers we will say that we need two components to get optimal predictions here finally we have the prediction plot you have to remember that predictions are always shown for just one variable at a time so it's not the full picture of the whole model we have in this case four different y variables and we are only shown one of them here but we can change the plot and, uh, and show the predictions of the other variables as well for any one variable that we choose like redness here we see on the bottom there's a number two shown that tells us that these are the predictions shown for a two-component PLS model. Sometimes the unscrambler will choose automatically the number of components and you have to make sure that this choice is reasonable. You have to decide how many components are reasonable. You will experience sometimes that unscrambler might give you plots for seven, eight, ten components and these predictions that you get from using that many components seem to be very very good but maybe they are not realistic so always remember that it's you and not unscrambler that decides how many components you need in the plot you see two versions of each sample a blue version and a red version the blue samples are showing us the predictions of the sample when it was included in the calibration model. On the x-axis we have the measured or reference value and on the y-axis we have the predicted one from the model. So these should be on the identity line if the model was working perfectly. The red uh, predictions are the predictions when the sample is not included in the model. So for an ideal model it should be close to the blue sample but you can see that for some of them they are quite far apart and in general the red ones are further away from the ideal line than the blue samples are. That's expected uh, as it's more difficult to predict a new sample than it is to predict a sample that was al already in the calibration model. But it's the red predictions that we are really interested in.